change. It's an unavoidable reality in our lives. Locations, jobs, relationships, lifestyles. The question has never been whether or not we will experience change. The question will always be, how will we respond? Will we embrace it and ultimately learn from it or ignore it and let it overwhelm our lives? Change is coming, ready or not. Good morning and welcome to Security First Baptist Church and uh, thank you for joining us on the last day of February. And uh, this morning will be our sermon title is Right with God. We'll be looking at Genesis 15, 1 through 6. And uh, can we be right with God? And how do we do that? What do the scriptures teach us about being right with God? And uh, so that will be uh, what we deal with this morning. What we're going to learn is in order to be right with God, we have to be honest with him and ourselves as well. And so that's in Genesis 15, 1 through 6. We're continuing to walk through that passage. And uh, so we'll see you here in a few minutes. Grab your coffee, your Bible. We'll see you in a little bit. Like Jesus, because Jesus saves. And so if you don't save documents all the time, then you just missed my joke. But Jesus saves. And so I try to be like Jesus when I'm doing sermons. I save about a thousand times when I'm typing, writing things, because if you've ever been typing and you have a paragraph and then all of a sudden something happens and it just disappears instead of getting angry you just remember to be like Jesus he saves all right what Genesis 15 Genesis 15 and our title this morning is right with God right with God can we be right with God how do we do that how good do you have to be to be right with God? And, um, and if there is a way, you know, how honest do I have to be? A lot of times when we come to church, a lot of times we call it a, a face mask or a church mask. Church face. There you go. And uh, we have what we appear to be, or like I like to say is a lot of people do it like a cross necklace. They bring out God when it's convenient. And when they don't want him to be around, they kind of stick it back under their shirt. And uh, a lot of times, we, you know, if I'm okay and you're okay, we're all okay. Everybody's okay. Uh, I grew up in church, uh, but been around the gospel my entire life. Was baptized when I was five or six, somewhere in there. Don't really remember a whole lot. That wasn't yesterday. From that time, I just remember being it. I remember swimming out because I fell off the chair because I was too short in the baptistry. So I slipped off and I just swam out of the baptistry. That was fun. And um, that's about how tall I was. And, uh, but I didn't get saved until I was 16. So what I want to talk about is your faith and belief and trust. What is righteousness? How do we get that way? And uh, what does our text teach us? We're in Genesis chapter 15. We're looking at verses 1 through 6. And you'll find in the scriptures that belief in God is pretty much the same from Genesis chapter 1 to Revelation, the last verse. Okay, so here we go. Genesis 15, verse 1. After these events, now, Brother Reagan, what events are you talking about? We're talking about Sodom and Gomorrah had been in a war with some other kings. They came over, took their stuff. Abram went out, defeated those kings, came back. A guy named Melchizedek blessed him, said some things about God, and uh, they got Lot back, and they've 
say all that dust is settled, everything's done, and God appears again to Abram again. After these events, the word of the Lord, this is a little different, came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward will be very great. But Abram said, Lord God, what can you give me since I am childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Abram continued, Look, you've given me no offspring, so a slave born in my house will be my heir. Now the word of the Lord came to him. This one will not be your heir. Instead, one who comes from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look at the sky and count the stars, if you are able to count them. Then he said to him, Your offspring will be that numerous. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. Have you ever been discouraged? I mean, not because you did some bad stuff and, and the consequences came. What if you were doing right? Have you ever felt that way? You, you did all the right stuff, you did all the right things, and nothing. You were doing all the correct things, but nothing seemed, you know, and ever, your life was okay, but there was this unsettling emptiness inside of you. Have you ever felt that way? And there was nothing that you could complain about. There was nothing that you could point at. It was just this emptiness. And you went to bed and you woke up the next morning and you did it. You talked to God. You, you did all that you needed to do and there's just a, an emptiness. And the longer that it just continues to grow and it continues to go, that emptiness just seemed to get a little bit bigger and a little bit darker and begin to warm up a little bit. And so in each of us, there's this dark emptiness that's warm. That's the best way I know how to explain it. I've bored to church for about 11 years. And I knew the scriptures, I knew them well. I knew all sorts of stuff, but I just couldn't put a finger on it. They had a joy, they had a peace that I didn't understand. And here we are in this text, Abram has defeated kings, he has got more stuff than you can possibly imagine, everything in his life is blessed, but he's unhappy and he's miserable. And so the way that God comes to him, actually this is the first time this occurs in our text, in the scriptures, is Genesis chapter 15, verse 1. It says, after these events, the word of the Lord came to Abram. Okay, so God reveals himself to Abram, and let me put a little side note. He reveals himself to you this way too, through his word. Amen. Okay, if God's going to reveal himself to you, he's going to do it through his word. And so God appears to Abraham and reveals his word to him. Now he does it in a unique way, it tells us in the text, that the Lord came to Abram in a vision. All right, now you're going to see this word throughout scripture. Maybe you've gotten there and, may, you know, sometimes when we read scriptures we don't understand something, we just kind of skip it. I don't know if you ever do that. You, well, I don't know what that means. You know, sometimes vision, we get afraid of those things, okay? Look, let's just talk about what it is. It's in the scripture. Let's talk about it. So well, it's God speaking, but it's also something that you see. Okay? If you've got one of those phones that are smart, they have something there called FaceTime, right? Okay? So you're talking to somebody, but you can actually see them. And so in this context, it's not just something that... He hears this voice coming from heaven or something. Okay? It's a lot louder than that. It's directly a personal thing that Abram sees, and usually you see in Scripture, and I'll bring some to your mind. Daniel experienced this. Ezekiel experienced this. Paul experienced this on the way to Damascus. Remember? There was a bright light that came from heaven, and he was speaking to Jesus. They kind of saw the light a little bit, but they didn't see him and didn't hear what he said. This happened to uh, Peter uh, when he was in, uh, my mind is Agrippa, not Agrippa, that's a king. 
Uh, it'll come to me later in the middle of the sermon. Um, but he was there, and uh, he remember the vision came from heaven. A table, a blanket came down with all the animals. You see this happen many times in Scripture. It's the first time it happens recorded in Scripture. And so God appears to him in a unique way, in a personal way. Understand this. God wants a personal relationship with you. So much so that he is going to come and will come to you and confront you. Now that sounds very threatening, doesn't it? Well, I was confronted all the time by my parents. They confronted me every day, in fact. Sometimes they confronted me with breakfast. Amen. I should have got an amen on that one. They always confronted me. They're, I was always living in front of them. Sometimes it, it really was, it was more dependent on how I was. So you live every day that you live before the Lord, whether you recognize it or not. And every day he provides for you breakfast, lunch, and dinner. He provides for you everything that you have. From the roof over your head, the car that you have, and if you don't have any of the things, the breath that you're breathing, the hair that may or may not be on top of your head. (laughs) Everything that you have comes from him. You live before him. Everyone understood this, but he had kind of forgotten about it. And so God comes and visits him in a vision. And what God does is he reveals himself through his word. Look at it. Uh, he says, I am your shield, and your reward will be very great. Now, if you don't remember, and you may not, and that's okay, we actually have seen this word in this statement before. There's additional thing added to it. We'll get to that in a minute. The word shield. We actually saw that in Genesis 14, 20, when a guy named Melchizedek, and we learned that he was Jesus, or not was, excuse me, is Jesus. He's not dead. He's alive. Amen? And so he is Jesus. So he comes down and reveals to Abram that God is his, his shield, his deliverer. We'll get to the word in a minute. Abram repeats that when he's talking to the king of Sodom. So this is something that he understood about God. Okay? And so that was a, a way that Abram could identify with God. So he comes now to relate to Abram, not during the battle. See, he understood that. God's my deliverer. He saves me from my enemies. But in this dark time where he's having some doubts, God appears to him again and says, hey, you know what? I'm not just your deliverer over the, the battle where you see these kings, but the struggle that you're dealing with right now, yeah, I'm your shield in this moment too. And he reminded Abram of who he is. Okay? And so he he reminded him of that. But then he adds a little bit to it. We're going to look at this. Uh, A little bit difficult to translate this into English. Your reward will be very great. Now this word actually means to hire. Or a wage. And so it's about your compensation. Okay, so what job did he get? Go back. Remember, who is Jesus to him? He is his Lord. He is God. He is ruler over all the heavens and earth. So as you submit to him, he said your reward, your compensation will be very great. Okay? So in all of Abram's struggles, what had he attained? Oh, he had all this stuff, right? There was something that we're missing. His reward is God. He said, I am your shield. I am your reward. See, in all of your struggles down in Egypt with these kings, what you have acquired was not just a bunch of possessions and all these things. What you have acquired is the knowledge of me. 
And, you know, I'm not coming to every single person in Canaan and talking to them. I'm talking to you. And what you have required is a relationship with me. And that is the greatest thing that you can receive is me. It's the best thing that you can get. And in all of his struggles and all of those things, what it yielded more than all these trivial things that pass away, it yielded a relationship and it revealed a knowledge and an opportunity to know God in the midst of it. And this is what God is trying to help him understand. His greatest acquisition was not all of the gold and the peoples, but God himself. And the greatest compensation that we receive as those who serve him is a deeper, personal, intimate relationship with him. And just a little side note as we move to the next point, which is dealing with fear and doubt. I just want to bring something out. It was just, sometimes you just have to say things to yourself. Have you ever tried to hide something from God? You ever tried to hide something from your parents? Hide something, well, I... If you're a child, plead the Fifth Amendment on that one. All right, so have you ever tried to hide something from somebody? Try to conceal it, try to keep it hidden? Have you ever had thoughts in your head and you're in church but you don't say it because you don't want anybody to know, you're afraid they may think little of you, think less of you, the doubts that you may have about your faith, doubts that you may have if you tithe, whether or not God's really going to come through, the doubts of whether if I lead, is God really going to help me do that? We don't talk about those, do we? You should with God. Because number one, he already knows. You're not hiding anything from him. And what you'll find in scripture with every single person that relates to God is they're always honest. And we see that in verse 2. But Abram said, Lord God, what can you give me since I'm childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Look at verse 3. Look! Behold, he's telling this to God, look, you have given me no offspring, so a slave born in my house will be my heir. That's pretty bold. Honest. All of us need a place where we can present our struggles. And Abram comes before God and he deals with God because, I mean, it's been a little while. And you know, a reminder here, when God told him he was going to have a kid, he was 75 years old. His wife was 65. They're not getting any younger. And he's getting a little frustrated, you could imagine. God had blessed him and made him great, made his name great. But he said he would give him descendants and he still doesn't have a kid. The literal translation of this, if you just take the Hebrew words, is he says, I walk stripped of a son to acquire what I possess. That it had been taken from him, this blessing. It had been stripped away from him. This is how he feels. This is where he's at. You said this would happen but it has been stripped away from me. Have you ever felt like that? The despair and the emptiness in your heart? Don't keep that to yourself. Remember that dark, empty, burning spot in your heart? It just gets bigger. And bigger. And hotter. What was his doubt? God, all of this is for nothing. I've done all these things. I've done all this stuff. And it's all going away. And not just, he, he's, he, he's seeing his limits. And the older you get, the more you begin to realize you know, or what is it called, over the hill? You're on the downside of it. 
You got to amen on that one. You're on the downside of it. That's getting a little closer every day. And everything that you've worked for, everything that you've done, everything that you've accomplished comes a dash on a tombstone. And this reality is hitting Abram, maybe hitting you. He recognizes his limits that he entered the world with nothing, he leaves the world with nothing, and all that he's acquired, not only his physical possessions, but even his knowledge of God. Remember, all nations are going to be blessed through him in every generation, but nah, unless it's one of his servants, and so he's struggling to understand God's will, God's ways, his purpose, and he doesn't have anybody he can talk to about it because nobody knows. So he goes straight to the source, and he's just completely and brutally honest. Have you been that way with yourself? And have you been that way with God? That's pretty bold, Brother Reagan. Every person in Scripture that knows and walks with God is that bold. Because, see, you're really being more honest with yourself than you are with God. But you know why we don't be honest with God? Because God knows the whole truth. See, we only like to bring up the he said part. We don't want the other side of the story. You see, what we're afraid of is if we confront God with this, God could say, well, look, Abram, you disobeyed me and went to Egypt. Do you remember that? You gave your wife to another man. Do you remember that? God could have done that. But he didn't, did he? Thank God. <laughs> that there's a way that all of our faults and all of our failures is we're dependent on ourselves to be good. I don't know about you, but I, I fail miserably. And what God wants us to do is bring our concerns and bring our heart and bring our fear and lay them at his feet. But Brother Reagan, that's dirty. That's messy. That, that, the be, you know, when I go to the shower, I don't get cleaned up to get there. I just go in dirt and all. And when you come to Jesus, you're not going to tell him anything or bring him anything that he doesn't already know and that he hasn't already dealt with. Amen. The reality of it is when you expose yourself to him, you expose yourself to the only person that can take care of you and, and heal you. <laughs> He already knows, but do we trust him? And see, that's the question that God has. Because the more I hide and the more I conceal and the more I walk away, that means I really don't trust you. I'm saying it with my lips, but my heart, no, no. A lot of people miss heaven by 18 inches. They believe God in their head, but not in their hearts. There's a general knowledge of God, but not a personal intimate. And the reason is, is we're not willing to open up and truly reveal our hearts to God. He does this, and look at verse 4. And we look at what righteousness is declared in this, patch, in this passage of Abram, so what is God looking for? How does that work? Here we go. So now the word of the Lord came to him. He said, so another new word comes. This one will not. God doesn't have to repeat himself, but he does. He's already told him he's going to have a kid, but he reminds him, this one will not, but one from your own body. Not from somewhere else. This is going to be your kid. Why? Because the promise was not Abram's. See, a lot of times what we do is God tells us something or, or we see something in scriptures and then we go try to do it. Apart from God on our own and in our own way. It doesn't work like that. The promise is God's. See, Abram did, it does all this stuff and he's going to continue to do so actually. He's doing all these other things 
But it's God's promise. And he'll fulfill it. And so many times I, I, I pray, I try to go to church, do all these things. But scriptures say, for God so loved the world. Right? That he gave. That he did something, not Reagan do something. And see, what happened with me was, and hopefully with you, is it wasn't, no, for God so loved the world. No, scratch that. Draw a line through that. No, no, no. For God to so love me. See, I'd heard for God so loved the world for my whole life. But when I, when that heaviness of the guilt of my sin and all that weight came upon me, oh, my soul. And then I understood. No, Jesus didn't just die for the world. I'm included in that. You remember the old hymn, Whosoever Surely Meaneth Me? That's a beautiful realization. When you recognize, yeah, God loves the world, but hey, he loves me. Sometimes we get, well, he loves everybody. But you don't understand. No, he loves me. If you knew me, you would think he wouldn't love me. But he loves me. That's why that's important. It has to be personal. It has to be real. God's promise was not to a general group of people. God's promise was to Abraham. And God's promise of salvation is not just to the entire world. It's a promise to you. A promise to me and anyone. I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's go to the next part. <laughs> anyone who believes, I'll finish the sentence. So he look, takes him outside, they do all that. And look at verse 6. When the knowledge of God moves to trust in him. See, he knew the promise. He'd already heard the promise, but he didn't believe it. You catch the difference? He'd heard the promise, but he really didn't believe it. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. So what does God do? He's looking for righteousness. So what does he credit as righteousness? When he went and he defeated the, the kings of Persia and all those guys? No. When God told him his word and he spoke the truth of what he needed to do and he trusted in what God said. That was credited as righteousness. What does John 3, 16 say? That whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. How do we receive eternal life? By going to church, praying, and doing all these good things? No. You inherit eternal life when you believe in Jesus. You, as he said it, you cross over from death into life. Not by works, but by faith. By trust. That's how you enter. Is when we realize that God is real, and the promise is between him and and me. There have been many a time when I didn't think where I doubt, where I've struggled with my faith. And, you know, there was I saved when I was five, when I was saved when I was 16. I don't know. Am I even saved now? I don't know. Brother Reagan, you struggle with that? Oh, yeah. That stuff is real right there. It's called flesh, it's carnal, it's sin, it's wicked. But see, I didn't save myself. So God reminds me, hey, buddy, hey, we're not enemies anymore. We're friends. Why? Because just like Abram, he trusted, he believed, he, he relied on, he depended upon what God said to him that night. And when God saw it, and he saw that trust, and he saw that dependency, and the surrender to what God said, that was credited to him as a rightness before God. Have you experienced that? Have you experienced that rightness with God? I remember when I was 16, oh my goodness, 
I ended up praying with a gentleman, and I remember the first thing that happened. I never experienced it before. People ex experience different things and say all the different things that they experience. But what I understood and is the only way to say it is peace and rest. There had been so much struggle in my heart, in my mind, the anxiousness, the anxiety of all of the burden, of all of trying to appear and to be all these things for my parents, for all this stuff. And when I surrendered my life to Jesus and gave, stop trying to do things on my own and truly place my trust in Jesus, man, it was like all the pressure and all the wind just stopped. And all of that emptiness was just filled with peace. And it wasn't because of the good things that I'd done. It was because of the good things that God has done on our behalf. And sometimes I still get stubborn. <laughs> and I still try to do things on my own. And we'll learn with Abram. He kind of did the same thing. And if we're honest, maybe we kind of do the same thing. But God is faithful. I won't get it into next week, but I'm holding it off for next week. God is faithful to himself and it's the relationship that he established based upon himself. That anyone who placed their trust in Jesus, who believes in him, will not perish, but have eternal life. What is eternal life? Knowing the one true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent, John 17, 3. Do you know him? When you go to work tomorrow, when you do whatever you do tomorrow, when you go home tonight, do you know him? Is it just the battles that you face? Is it just that thing that you do at church? Or is it like God here in this dark time in Abram's life where God comes right beside him and says, hey, you know, I delivered you then, I'll deliver you now. What do you need to be delivered from today? What do you need to be safe from? Your sin? A habit? A vice? Maybe you need God's power to do something he's wanting you to do. It scares you to death. Or maybe it's a path that you chose that you didn't choose. God wants to help you. But you have to be honest. I remember that night when the preacher was there and I, he said, if you know that you're a sinner and you want to make Jesus the Lord of your life, raise your hand. And I sat there for, it felt like an eternity. It's probably just 15 seconds. Wrestling with myself. Struggling with myself. I've already done this. I don't know if you've ever experienced a battle within yourself. Like two dogs. Who wins? The one you say sick them to. The one that you feed. The one. And that night, I defeated myself. Who's in charge of you? Jesus or you? That night sitting there, everyone saw the Lord. And he learned that God was still the Lord over not his good stuff, but his bad stuff too. And God would help him. And God would deliver him. And Abram committed himself to the Lord that night. Have you? Have you made Jesus the Lord of your life? And is he the Lord of all of it? Well, of course he is, brother. Oh, really? Of all of it. What areas do you need to yield to him today? Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your kindness. Thank you that anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And this isn't based on our ability to call. It's just a simple thing based upon the work of Jesus Christ on the cross.
It's as simple as us just simply asking for help. But Lord, for us to do that, we have to admit that we need it. So this morning, I pray that you would give us the grace to ask. To not be self-sufficient, to not be self-reliant, but to come into your presence, confess our needs, confess our weakness, confess our sin, so that we would find a peace that passes all understanding. Help us in this battle with ourselves. We pray for help in Jesus' name. Would you stand with me, please? What is God asking of you this morning? For some, it may be that you make Jesus the Lord of your life. For others of us, it just may be fears. These are unsettling times. Pandemics, freezes, with no promise of what tomorrow might hold either. Maybe that scares you to death. Well, we have a God that conquered death, and he can help you through this too. I don't know all the needs and struggles in here, but we have a God that does. Surrender yourself to him today. Whatever your need is, as we sing, come.